Good afternoon, saints, and welcome to our Wednesday afternoon Bible study. Uh, we are continuing now with the book of Acts. Last time we were, we did the book of John and we proceeded into uh, Sunday, but now we're getting back into our regular routine, our regular calendar and schedule. <clears throat> so today we're uh, back to Acts chapter 8. And the title is Philip's Work in Samaria and Judea. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 25 of Acts chapter 8. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. So uh, let's open up our Bibles to Acts, 1, Acts 8, looking at verses 1 to 25. And let's begin with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for this new day to learn more of you. And today, dear Lord, you want to talk to us about the gospel being open to all generations, to all nations, rather, starting off with the Jewish people, branching out to all people, all we Gentiles, to the ends of the earth. So, Lord, may the Holy Spirit, which lives and works in each and every one of us, may he give us wisdom and understanding. And may it abound to the glory, to your glory, edification of your people. And we pray you brought someone among us today who does not know you. And through this Bible study, we'll be able to believe and trust as Jesus, confessing their sins and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. In his precious name we pray. Amen. So if you just joined us, we are uh, looking at Acts chapter 8. And we'll be reviewing verses 1 through 25 and reading from the New International Version. So let's begin. We're looking first of all at verses 1 through 4. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. That means the death of Stephen. If we remember a week before last, we were studying the deacon Stephen giving his witness before the Sanhedrin and how they grabbed him and stoned him to death. Continuing, on that day, the same day that, uh, that uh, Stephen was killed, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Saints, our Lord Jesus foretold that the witness to him would be taken throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now with this it began to happen as an indirect and unintended result of persecution. It appears that God's church always grows in times of persecution. A general and severe persecution of believers began on this very day of Stephen's martyrdom. Acts 11, if we go about uh, da, 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 three chapters ahead of us, verses 19 and 20, tells us that some of the scattered believers went beyond Judea and Samaria, always witnessing where they were. For it reads, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. You notice that it said godly men went and buried Stephen. Well, the godly men who buried Stephen included Jews who had been touched by his testimony before the Sanhedrin. They buried and mourned for him because they knew he was not guilty of the charge of blasphemy and that his death had not been based on a verdict of a legal trial. If anything, it was like a mob. 
The apostles, however, you note, remained and they stayed in Jerusalem. Why? To encourage those believers who remained behind in prison or were in hiding. Saul, who would later become Paul, was like a raging wild animal in his efforts to destroy the Christian church. He himself later described his activity during this period in Acts chapter 22, verse 4. He writes by the Spirit, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. Further along in Acts 26, 26, 10, and 11, he writes, On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. We find that he had approved, Saul or later Paul, had approved of Stephen's execution, and he wanted to follow through by destroying the Christian church. The Sanhedrin provided temple guards for the raids which he conducted. And it's a sad thing to say, saints, that some of the worst persecutions of the church have been by members of the church. The persecution and scattering did not result in the church's disappearance, did it? No. On the contrary, it played a plan a major role in the planting of new churches because as they scattered they went and told people about Jesus because they couldn't remain in Jerusalem could they ordinary Christians shared their faith wherever they went that's what we're supposed to do saints the enemies of the church did their worst but God turned their evil intentions to serve his gracious purpose and we know what he did with Saul Verse 5 tells us, Philip then went down to Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. So the scene changes, okay, from Saul and what he was doing to now Philip. Now remember, Philip is one of the 12 deacons, pardon me, one of the seven deacons that were chosen. Remember, they were doing the work of making sure that both the Judaic and the Grecian widows uh, did receive the same amount of welfare or care. What well, we find here in verse 5, it was not one of the twelve, but one of the seven who began the work of preaching to non-Jews. The apostles did their work where they were until God's providence or special direction placed them elsewhere. Now Philip no longer needed to administer the welfare program for the church in Jerusalem, went north to Samaria. He went to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ to the people who were the religious opponents and racial enemies of the Jewish people. The Samaritans also waited for the Messiah, referring to him as Taheb, T-A-H-E-B, if you want to look it up, Taheb, meaning he who restores. Isn't that something? And we know when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, verses 6 and six through 8 reads, When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. We know that the Lord said signs and wonders would accompany the preaching of the gospel. Well, the gospel accompanied by signs did its work among the Samaritans as it had among the Jews in Jerusalem. And now looking at verses 9 through 13, we read, Now for some time, here we introduce a new character, or John does. Not John, Luke. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is a divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Peter as he, pardon me, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, 
they were baptized, both men and women. We see the work of making people's disciples is not us. We just have to faithfully witness. That's our first let's lesson. We keep faithfully witnessing and let the Spirit do his work. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and the miracles he saw. The gospel which Philip preached did not only deliver the Samaritans from religious error and, alien, and ailments of body and spirit, it also delivered them from the longtime evil influences of a practitioner of the occult. This man, Simon, had people believing he was the manifestation of God Almighty. Simon believed and was baptized. But the weakness of his faith will become evident as the story unfolds in this chapter. You see, it appears that Simon did seem to be more impressed by the signs and wonders which were part of Philip's ministry, though, many, though more impressed by that than he was by Philip's preaching or teaching. He had amazed so many by his tricks was astonished by he by uh, Philip's actual uh, God-inspired healing work. So here we introduce to this guy Simon, who tricks people and has them believe that he's doing the work of God. But certainly, I'm sure to prosper himself. So verses 14 through 17 reads: When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Saints, we're not told why the apostles sent Peter and John to visit Philip in his mission field. We can assume that their purpose was to supervise the work and offer suggestions and help to Philip. The seven, meaning the seven deacons, had not become the apostles' peers, were not on the same level of responsibility uh, when they were chosen for the work of distributing welfare. They worked under the supervision of the apostles. Now one of these seven administrators, these seven deacons, was working as an evangelist. Question was for the church in Jerusalem, how was Philip faring? How was he teaching? On Pentecost and thereafter, the Holy Spirit was received in holy baptism. In Samaria, there was a unique situation that the Holy Spirit had not yet been received. Now, saints, we're not told that there was something wrong with the way Philip baptized or that the Samaritans had failed to reach some standard or fulfill some condition. We are simply told that the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. The usual and expected thing had not occurred. Their sins, however, were forgiven, but there was no evidence of the Spirit's message or, pardon me, the Spirit's presence. Now the question is, why did God delay the giving of the Holy Spirit? Well, God used this unique situation to demonstrate to the apostles and to the Samaritans and to the whole church that the old barriers between Jews and non-Jews had been removed. The church was to become one church and not a Jewish church and not a Samaritan church separately. The Lord demonstrated this to the apostles and accomplished this work through the, through the apostles as an object lesson on the unity of all believers. Now the apostles had not yet begun to make disciples of all nations yet, but it was clear to them that the gospel, faith, and the gift of the Holy Spirit were for all nations and races because the Gentiles the Samaritans did believe. Now, verse 18 and 19. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, 
so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, whoa, here we go. Here the real motives for Simon come up. But now it doesn't mean that he didn't believe. He just didn't understand the extent of, his, of what the belief meant. This man, Simon, had been acclaimed as the great power. Then he himself wants to buy the power of God. He had fallen back into his old ways. And how could he not consider his motive? We are not told what the visible evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence was that Simon saw. For it says, Simon saw the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands. He offered them money. So he saw it, but we're not told what it was. The buying, by the way, on a sidebar, the buying and selling of church offices and favored positions in the ministry today is known as simony, simony, okay? The word comes from this man, Simon, who tried to buy a share in the apostolic ministry. Now our final verses, verses 20 to 24. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, that nothing you have said may happen to me. Saints, we see here now that we are told Simon himself believed. Now his heart, however, was still not right with God. And Peter cursed his conniving unbelief. May your money perish with you, is what Peter said. This was a very harsh saying, wasn't it? Considering the man is a neophyte, he didn't know. He thought maybe that's how uh, uh, Philip got this power. Um, the Holy Spirit, however, or I have here, this was very harsh saying, but it was necessary to call him to repentance. Sometimes we have to be slapped over the head, not just touched on the cheek. The Holy Spirit is God's gift, not to be bought or in any way earned. Simon's desire to use the Holy Spirit to enhance his power and his popularity was blasphemous, wasn't it? God will not be used by anyone, no more than he will be deceived. Amen. God will not be mocked, my mother-in-law always said. To imagine that a gift can be bought is to turn grace into a business transaction. And then it is no longer grace, is it? Simon could not have a pair or share in the ministry of the apostles because it was a ministry of grace. And he did not understand at all what grace is. He didn't know why you give to bless others. But why did Peter say, perhaps he will forgive you? Perhaps. He said, perhaps you, he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. There is never a question of the Lord's willingness to forgive, is there? The only uncertainty was whether Simon could repent. When we look at it, Simon's request for the apostles' intercession, for he says in verse 24, Pray to the Lord for me, that nothing you have said may happen to me. We are mindful of uh, Pharaoh, who asked Moses to pray to the Lord to withdraw the plague of thunder and hail, Exodus 9.28. Each asked the Lord's spokesman to pray on his behalf. We are not told that either of them prayed on his own behalf. Did Simon, like Pharaoh, harden his heart, or did he repent? Luke does not tell us. Second century Christian writers refer to him as the father of all heresies, Simon. And then verse 25, this is our last verse. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan towns. So here we see the apostles, uh, Peter and John, took the opportunity on their homeward way to preach the gospel to non-Jews non as they went forward, using the opportunity to return 
uh, the opportunities of the return trip to Jerusalem to do so. God was keeping the promise, wasn't he? He had made through Joel the prophecy which Peter pro, uh, quoted on Pentecost. Acts 2.17 and Joel 2.28 read, In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, all people. So saints, that ends our, our Bible study for today. Next week, we'll come back and continue this chapter uh, and conclude it. Next week, we'll look at uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. This time, we're looking at Philip sharing the gospel in Samaria and also meeting up with Simon the sorcerer. So question, so saints, uh, continue to read, excuse me, continue to read through the scripture, study it. You know, here we see today that God's gospel is for everyone. God's gospel to everyone. Also understand that some of us don't always get it right away. Some people become Christians for uh, personal and wrong motives like Simon. Some of us misinterpret what we hear like Simon. But let's also realize a very important factor here, another lesson, that we should never be impressed uh, with signs and wonders. What God does that's really impressive is how through his word, through his spirit, he daily keeps us, preserves us, and uses us in the faith. So may God bless you and keep you for the rest of this day. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago. Not too hot, not too cold, rather breezy. And uh, may God use you, my friend. And may we see you again on Sunday as we have the Sunday Bible study at 930 followed by at 11 o'clock our live stream worship. So God bless you and have a good remainder of the day in the Lord. Take care.